Wow, looks like we got a good crowd today. Saw a bunch of people chatting up. I saw somebody congratulate JP. What happened to you, JP? Uh, text, text in the uh, type. What, what happened? Must have been something cool. Hi, Maya. Good to see you. Camille. Let's see. Michael Kirchhoff. Uh, something cool. Hi, Maya. Good to see you. I forget to do that every time. Okay, let's see. Good morning, Aish. Android. Leanne's got the uh, iPhone 6. Why do y'all get Android phones? iPhones are so much better, right? Hola and Lola. I know, I need to remember to turn off my phone every time, don't I? Cool. Let's go ahead and get into the lecture. Um, we talked about the eugenics movement this past week, and we talked about how this was a selective sterilization movement based on the idea that we could somehow selectively breed uh, certain qualities out of the human race. And the particular quality that seemed to strike everybody's interest, because it was a newly developed test and it seemed really scientific and it showed a genetic quality, was the IQ test. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the history and uh, the nature of IQ testing as well as its limitations. Okay, let's see. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to talk about the history and types of IQ tests. We're going to talk about the properties of IQ tests. I'm going to talk a couple of minutes about IQ and genetics. Um, we're going to talk about uh, observed differences in IQ scores, and then we're going to talk a little bit about newer ther theories of intelligence. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about IQ testing. So um, Alfred Binet was asked by the French government, the French government, write that down, that is important, um, to uh, invent a test to help them identify students who were slow or behind in school who needed extra help, developmentally challenged children. And he came up with a short IQ test uh, that involved 30 questions, which he thought measured your aptitude rather than your achievement. So we're going to talk about these two different things. A test of aptitude all right, is a test of how clever you are, how quickly you could learn something. And a test of achievement is a test on some body of knowledge you should have learned. Okay, so for example, Nicole, you're in nursing classes, so you probably have a body of knowledge that I don't have. Um, so if we took a nursing test, uh, you would score much better than nursing tests on me. Now, that doesn't make you necessarily smarter. You just have studied a particular body of knowledge. Um, the test that we're going to have in here next week, the midterm, is a test of achievement. Your math test is a test of achievement. Um, and these are tests of whether or not you have learned a particular uh, bit of information. On the other hand, Alfred Binet invented a test of aptitude, which he thought measured how quickly a child would be able to learn. I hope, uh, I hope you understand that. Good morning, Jack. Um, so, he was asked to design a test to identify kids that might need extra resources or special education. Um, slow kids. And so he developed a 30-question uh, test that was designed to identify your mental age. Do you, are you have the mind of a three-year-old, the mind of a four-year-old, the mind of a five-year-old? If any of you have ever heard of being on grade level on a test, that's exactly what he was talking about. What should a three-year-old be able to do? What should a four-year-old be able to do? And the idea behind the first IQ test was sort of like the end of grade test. Are you ahead of grade level or below re reading? level, right? I don't know if you've ever seen those kind of uh, ev evaluations of your children, or maybe if you were younger, you remember when you were reading, were you at grade level or above grade level? So the first test sort of created uh, a ratio by comparing your mental age, the age at which your mind was operating, with your chronological age to give you a ratio. So these first tests were what we called ratio tests. Now, if you were as, if you were six years old, that was your chronological age, and you could answer the questions that a six-year-old could, your ratio would be six over six, or one. 
If on the other hand, your mind, you can answer the questions mentally that a nine-year-old could, but your uh, chronological age was six, your ratio would be 1.33. You would be ahead, if you will. If, on the other hand, your chronological age was nine and you could, uh, and your mental age was six, your ratio would be six divided by nine, or 0.67. Does that make sense? And so the first IQ test used these ratio message, method. In fact, uh, on your Neuromatrix quiz, it'll be useful for you to, under, to see this formula. Now, uh, William Stern, uh, uh, the first IQ test, in order to get the, uh, the, um, p the decimal out of it, uh, William Stern suggested that they multiply the ratio by 100. So if you folks have ever heard of IQ tests, you know that 100 is average. That 100 is derived from this old formula that was used back in 1906. All right, now, uh, this test was invented to help school children uh, in France. Uh, Louis Terman at Stanford University found out about this test and brought it over here for use in the United States. It turned out to be a huge hit, and in World War I, the first widespread use of IQ testing was done on military recruits for World War I. This test was known as the Alpha Army Test. Have any of you ever heard of an IQ test that they give to all new recruits when they enter the uh, Army? If anybody knows the name of that test, go ahead and type it in the chat bar. So, here's the problem though. The ratio method is kind of flawed. It's great for three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds, but it's not good for adults, right? So if I told you that a kid was six years old and they were reading like a nine-year-old, you would say, wow, that kid is super duper ahead. That makes sense, right? On the other hand, if your nine-year-old was reading like a six-year-old, you might say, wow, that kid is really behind. But what if I told you I was a 50-year-old reading like a 60-year-old? or I'm a 30-year-old reading like a 25-year-old. See, the ratios don't really make sense when you're talking about adult, in, 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 adult intelligence. So what they do now is they use this thing called the deviation method. Instead of trying to figure out how old your mind is, what they do is they find a sample of people who are your age, give them the test, and they figure out how well that group of people scores at your age. And the person who's in the middle is given the number 100, average. And if you score better than the person, the 50th percentile, your IQ is higher. If you score lower than the 50th percentile, your IQ is uh, lower than 100. Does that make sense? ASVAB, Riley is very good on the ASVAB. Uh, yes, that is exactly the IQ test. Good job. So the uh, newer tests, modern tests of IQ, don't try to figure out your chronological age and your mental age. Instead, they compare you against all the people who are your age. So I'm 51 years old. So we all take this IQ test. It's 200 questions long. And whatever the 50th percentile is, however many questions that person scores, they are given the, the arbitrary number 100. And if you score higher than that, you get a number higher than 100. If you score lower than that, you get a, lower, a number lower than 100. Now, the weird thing is, if you give people this IQ test, what you're gonna find is that their scores tend to distribute in a pretty characteristic sort of uh, curve known as the normal distribution. Most of us are going to score somewhere in the middle near each other. A few of us are going to score a ton of questions and score way higher than everybody else. And a few of us are really going to struggle and not be able to answer very many questions. But most of us are going to be clumped somewhere there in the middle. And IQ tests show this normal distribution. And so doctors have given numbers to people uh, uh, labels to people based upon how they score on the IQ test. So if you score in the middle 68% of the population, you have a score somewhere between 85 and 115. And we're going to give you the label average in intelligence. For better or for worse, that's the label you're going to be given. All right. On the other hand, if you represent uh, the 
13, uh, let's see, the 27%, that's a little more extreme, the 13.5 on the top and the 13.5 on the bottom, you represent what we would call above average in the distribution. So 70 to 84 is what we would call below average, and 116 to 129 would be above average. Now, 2% of us are gonna score higher than everybody else on this IQ test. If you score higher than that, your IQ is going to be 130 and above, and you're going to get a, a name they call gifted. Some of you in third grade may have taken an IQ test that puts you in the gifted or close to gifted range. Actually, I think it's the top 5% for AG education, not the top 2%. But if you got into gifted education, you were way up there near the top end of the distribution. Now, if you're at the bottom end of the distribution, way down there below, we typically see people who have some sort of developmental disorder, some sort of genetic or chromosomal disorder, um, or people who have experienced terrible neglect and, uh, and some sort of uh, damage to their brain. So you're going to see that bottom part of the distribution. Okay, good deal. So Leanne remembers that curve from the math distribution. Turns out a lot of human qualities are going to follow this sort of distribution. Personality tests show this same distribution. Most of us are in the middle when it comes to extroversion. A couple of us are crazy, crazy extroverts, and a couple of us are crazy, crazy introverts, but most of us are in the middle. Weight, height, shoe size, they all follow this normal distribution. All right, so this is how IQ scores are interpreted. Now, I haven't told you what IQ is. And the first people who developed IQ tests didn't really ask the question, what is intelligence? Instead, they tried to develop a test that was useful for, for helping identify students who were going to do well in school. Now, they did have one debate, and the debate was, is intelligence one thing that allows you to do all kinds of intellectual activities, or is intelligence a bunch of special abilities, right? So do you have just one computer, and if that computer's good, it can do thing, all things well? Or do you have multiple computers that can each do individual abilities? You folks probably all have the experience of either being good at math or good at English class. How many of you in, in uh, YouTube land are good at math but bad at English? Or, or history, hate history. And on the other hand, how many of you are the opposite way? You like English and history, but math is really, really difficult for you. If you have that kind of experience, what you're describing is something similar to what we would call the S theory of intelligence. Uh, S being a bunch of specific things. Now, it turns out, though, that if you're pretty good at English, you're probably going to be pretty good at math. They are independent, but they do tend to correlate with one another. So finally, what uh, clinical psychologists, psychometricians, and other people who were developing IQ tests uh, began to realize is that you can think of IQ as one universal computing ability that can be broken down into sub qualities of, of inf information processing, all right? Now, I don't want you to remember this on the test, but the idea is that there are, uh, that when you take an IQ test, you are going to get one score, which represents your general IQ score. And then if you look down below that on your IQ profile, what you're going to notice is that there will be subscale scores representing the idea that we believe that intelligence or that IQ is one general ability, but you can break it down into sub abilities, if you will. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And so when you get your IQ test, not only is it going to give you one number, it's usually going to give you somewhere between well, I've seen some where they give you two broad numbers like verbal and performance IQ. And then I've seen some that break it down and give you uh, 11 or 12 categories like those listed in number three. 
And if you'll see this picture that's right underneath me, you do not have to remember that for the test. But I want you to see that uh, on level one, that's sort of that omnibus IQ thing. And then we do appreciate the fact that people's intellect is not one rock thing. Instead, it's a bunch of smaller uh, composite abilities that make up this larger thing called G. I hope I made sense. Now, there are lots of different kinds of IQ tests that will compare your ability to do school-related tasks with other people's ability to do school-related tasks. And I've got types of, uh, place, types of IQ tests that you'll see. The Stanford Binet was the oldest test that was developed based off of... Um, based off of uh, uh, Alfred Binet's work. It was the one that was developed, I think, in 1912. It's the oldest of the IQ test. Now, the one that you're going to find, if you go to a clinical psychologist's office, if any of you have ever taken an IQ test in a clinical psychologist's office, you probably took what's called the Wechsler scales, the Wechsler scales. This is the most popular IQ test to use in a clinical setting. Now, sometimes IQ tests... Sometimes IQ tests are given in a one-on-one -on -one setting in a psychologist's office, and sometimes most of you who took an IQ test took it in school as a paper and pencil test, okay? The Wechsler scale is going to be the most popular test it to be used in a clinical setting, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Now, this guy, David Wexler, was the first to pioneer three different uh, tests based upon your age. Now, you may or may not know this, but IQ tests, whatever they measure, can be reliably measured starting at the age of four. So, David Wexler has an IQ test for preschool children, and it measures IQ best in children from the four to six range. All right. Now, if you go to your uh, school counselor and they send you to a school psychologist who gives you a test when you're in middle school, you probably took the WISC, which is the Wechsler Intelligence Scale for Children. And that's for kids who are in primary and in, in, uh, in middle school from six to probably around 14 or 15. If any of you had to take a, an IQ test in a psychologist's office as a teenager or an adult, you probably took the WACE, the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale for Children. And the thing is, they do this because there are some assumptions you can make based upon the child's develop, the kid, person's developmental age. There are some questions you do not need to ask the average four-year-old, right? So that are more uh, appropriate for an adult or uh, an older child. Now, if your kid is super duper smart and gifted, they might start with a more difficult test. And uh, if any of you uh, took went to AG in middle school, you had to pass two uh, IQ tests. The first one uh, was designed for all children, and the second one was designed to measure the higher end of the IQ spectrum. Okay, so there are different designs of IQ tests. They're based upon age, and they can even base, be based on ability level, too. Now, the Woodcock-Johnson test is probably the test most of you took in middle school. It's the most popular paper and pencil test. Now, the problem with the paper and pencil test, as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one test with a clinical psychologist, is language problems, reading difficulties, attention problems, other things that are not IQ might affect your ability to do well on a test in a school setting. These are things, however, a clinical psychologist would notice if they were giving you a one-on-one -on -one IQ test. Do you see the difference? So if we're really going to do something important about your education, if you're in a court setting and uh, you may be given the death penalty if you're deemed 
uh, to have an IQ above 70, your IQ must be tested in a one-on-one -on -one setting so that the clinical psychologist can evaluate other factors that might impact your IQ score. But in order to figure out who goes to gifted school every, every year, uh, your third grade class gives everybody a paper and pencil test to sort of figure out who the, uh, who the AG kids should be. I hope that makes sense. AG was developed um, as part of the IDEA Act, uh, which was developed in the early 70s to uh, treat people with special needs in school. Uh, back in the day, if you were a kid with a disability and you couldn't do what all the other kids did, no matter what your disability was, be it dyslexia or a math disorder or an attention disorder, you just failed out of school. But people realized that some people have special needs that have to be met that the school's normal curriculum doesn't meet. And so the IDEA Act was created. And so the, uh, what, they do, what the IDEA Act says is that for kids who fall outside the middle part of the IQ spectrum, okay, so for the kids on either end of this spectrum, the school has to provide uh, extra resources. So the kids down here at the bottom end of the spectrum uh, who have attention problems or reading problems get special treatment. Now, and allowances are made for their performance based upon their disability. Well, the same thing happens with the uh, kids who are gifted. Uh, they, in a sense, have special needs as well. And so AG was designed as sort of an intervention for high-functioning kids. And both the uh, kids at, at both ends of the IQ spectrum, your teacher will have an IEP or you will have an IEP. I'll bet some of you have heard of an individualized education plan. That goes along with the IQ test that they do that had to take an elementary school, the Case 21 test. You know what, I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to do a little research. I've never heard of Case 21. They may have been an IQ test, I'm not sure. So, okay, you have an IQ around 125. Good job, ju Judo Judd. Uh, you're a clever guy, I can tell. Okay. Yeah, they, they do try to make these, uh, these interventions. There are some good things in the American education system, Edda, uh, and we also have some shortcomings in the American education system. Uh, so it has both good and bads. Yeah, um, and uh, even the gifted kids, we typically associate IEPs with learning disabilities, but the gifted kids get IEPs too. And it's just a way to try to specialize and uh, 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 specialize instruction to help everybody develop at the fastest rate possible. Now, here's the deal. IQ tests are measurement tools, and there's actually a branch of psychology that uh, focuses on designing uh, these psychological measurement tools. These people are called psychometricians. Matrician is measure, psycho, the mind. So psych psychometry, psychometricians, are a very important subfield in psychology. We didn't really mention them because they're not very exciting, right? It's not a very sexy thing. They do a lot of statistics. They know all about item response analysis and designing tests to measure psychological constructs accurately. Now, here's the thing. Uh, ooh, you know what? I am sorry. I did slip over one thing before I move on to the properties of good tests. Uh, so IQ tests are also used in business settings, in military settings as well. So the ASVAB test is an IQ test uh, designed to classify military recruits. And I don't know if any of you have heard it. Uh, I'm a football fan, so I do know that the NFL gives the Wonderlick IQ test. It's a short paper and pencil IQ test to all football recruits. And every year you're going to hear a news story on ESPN about the recruit that scored super duper high on the Wonderlick test, or they'll be poking fun at the athlete that scores poorly on the Wonderlick test. But businesses 
use IQ tests as well. In fact, I remember reading a news story uh, about a police department that was getting sued in New Hampshire because they didn't hire a fellow because his IQ score was too high. And their research had shown that people with high IQ scores found police work boring and quit the job within a year. And so they didn't hire him and he sued the police department complaining against discrimination. Well, that's an interesting, I just looked down and noticed Etta's uh, comment. She came from a small village and special needs were in my class as well. They just didn't uh, pay attention to them. Yeah, in the United States, they do try to, uh, to, to help those children uh, with the... Um, with 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 developmental disabilities the idea is that a learning disability is the same thing as a kid with a physical disability so just like we provide uh, ramps so that uh, kids in wheelchairs can get in the classroom we have to provide ramps for kids with uh, in intellectual or with uh, learning disabilities that's a, that's a good point. Aish just put him on notice, right? So here's the deal, though. If you think about it, your job depends upon your IQ test. I don't know if you knew this, but in the United States, we do not execute people who are uh, deemed uh, uh, psychologically disabled or people with uh, low IQ scores. Uh, your a job in the military depends on your IQ score. Your education depends upon your IQ score. This measurement has to be freaking good in order for it to be useful. We require of a society that this test actually measures what it's supposed to measure, okay? So an IQ test and any other psychological test you take is a tool. And just like a, 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 a bathroom scale or just like um, a, a, a tape measure that measures distance or a ruling ruler, uh, an IQ test has to have the properties of a good measurement tool. Now, there are several different properties we could talk about, and if this was a uh, testing class, I would get into more complex issues, but we're going to focus on two main issues. One is called the reliability of the test, and the second is the validity of the test, right? So psychometricians are trying to make tests that give the same measurement each time you measure the same thing. So if I designed a bathroom scale and you jumped on it 10 times in a row and got 10 different weights, you would know that that bathroom scale is not very useful. By the same token, if I measure your IQ multiple times, unless you get some sort of training, your test should show about the same score every time. And a harder question is to decide whether or not I am really measuring what it is I think I'm measuring right? So if I took a tape measure and wrapped it around your head, okay, and your head was 21 inches, and I said that people who had bigger heads were smarter, you would say, Chris, I don't think your measure of head size is a valid uh, measure of intellect. You're not really measuring your intelligence, okay? So two things that psychologists were interested in when they were developing IQ tests. Can we get something that gives us the same measurement every time? And how sure are we that the test we've designed is actually measuring what we think it measures? Now, let's evaluate the IQ test on these two qualities. It turns out that IQ test scores, whatever they measure, are extremely reliable beginning at the age of four. If you score in the 86th percentile at age four, you're probably going to be in the 86th percentile at age 14, the 86th percentile at age 24, and 34, and 44. You know what? I'll, I haven't been able to find a good IQ test, which is why I don't have one in the class, but I'd love to give you one that at least kind of looked like one, right? So, um, uh, so uh, you know what? I'll look for one because I see a couple of you mentioning that. Maybe I'll, I should talk about that. Um, so IQ tests are extremely reliable, all right? Um, now, the question is, do they really measure 
what it mean, what are we actually measuring with an IQ test? Now, the first IQ tests were not developed with a theory of what it means to be intelligent. They were really designed with an eye towards telling us who is going to do well in school. So IQ tests focus mainly on what we would call school intelligence or those qualities that allow you to do well in school. And so uh, there are people who have grave criticisms about the validity of IQ tests because it turns out when you mention IQ tests, people think intelligence. And IQ and intelligence are two different things. They may be related, but they're not the same thing. Now, what are some things that your book's going to talk about that, que that have people questioning the validity of IQ tests? Number one is the first uh, uh, is that IQ tests do show ethnic differences, right? Now, they, these tests were originally designed by white Europeans. They use language, and these tests show systematic biases against people of color, African Americans um, and, uh, and, and Hispanics. Uh, now, it turns out that if you give people tests that are more based on math abilities, these differences among ethnic groups tend to go away. So there are some people who argue that the very nature of testing people using language um, may be some sort of, may contain some sort of cultural bias. And if you're in my developmental psych class next semester, we'll talk about this a little more in, in a little more detail. Okay. Um, now, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, let's see what quiz there are set to do. So the second one um, is the weird thing about IQ is it seems to be rising every semester. Now, I mean, every generation. So what they have to do every 10 years or so is they renorm a test. We have to find out what average is, who is in that 50th percentile. And it turns out that every, every generation, uh, you have to score more questions correct to Oh, in order to be deemed uh, average. So uh, what would be above average in 1930 would actually be a below average score in, in 2000. And so it's weird. We seem to be, are we really developing our intelligence every semester? Are human beings getting more intelligent? Or again, is it some sort of characteristic of the testing procedure? Maybe human beings are getting better at testing and whatnot. So is this, uh, and schooling is getting better. So are human beings getting smarter or are we just measuring the improvement in school-related activities? Right. And you know what? Most people, uh, when they talk about intelligence, want to talk about things like creativity, uh, common sense, uh, motivation, the ability to to uh, to uh, schmooze people and get what you want. None of these qualities are included on IQ tests. Right. IQ tests only measure school related activities. So how can we be sure that an IQ test measures this thing we call intelligence? Okay. Um, yes, I uploaded this new PowerPoint about 15 minutes before class. I'm always updating my PowerPoints every semester. So I would usually wait until right before class before I would upload the PowerPoint. Okay. African American learn 30 less words a year than white kids, so that discrepancy makes sense and may not just be a bias in testing. Well, and you know, here's the weird thing, Lisa Marie. Uh, uh, because we have this thing called the Flynn effect, one of the uh, one of the explanations is that schooling and this improvement in schooling is generational, and each generation schools its children a little bit better. I just finished reading a book about the history of education in America, and it turns out that some of these minority groups were completely blocked out of uh, the early 18th, 19th century American educational process. And so if doing well on an IQ test really relates to experience with school, then you might expect that an eth ethnic group that was blocked, that started the educational process later, might be behind in uh, measurements based on that educational system. Does that make sense?
So like my parents taught me better than their parents and their parents taught them better than the parents before. But all of this was based upon experience in the organized classroom. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I'm blathering looking at my screen and I can't tell if I'm making any sense or not. Okay, now, uh, one of, if you remember, we talked about the eugenics movement and the idea that uh, we could change the quality of our population by selecting out some genes. This was based on the idea that IQ had a genetic component. There is a lot of research um, ab about the... Um, about the nature of IQ. Is it determined by your environment or is it determined by your uh, genetic component? Uh, let me see, what is that controversy? The uh, intelligence controversy, controversy, uh, fake data. What was that one called? Oh, the Burt Affair, the Cyril Burt Affair. Okay, now here's the deal. There's been a total uh, focus on trying to prove that intelligence is either created by genes or created by environment. If you remember when I talked about chapter six behaviorism and I talked about the eugenics movement uh, this week, I told you that they were at odds uh, and the behaviorists wanted to believe that intelligence was totally a product of your environment and the eugenics wanted to prove that uh, that uh, intelligence was totally a product of your genes. So there are a lot of scientific studies trying to prove uh, one way or the other. And some of them actually turned out to be great hoaxes. If anybody's interested in reading about an, a hoax related to intelligence testing, I suggest you Google the Cyril Burt Affair. C-Y-R-I-L Burt Affair. He, uh, there's some question about his his data. Now, uh, behavioral genetics is the is the field of uh, science that is interested in assessing the impact of genes on an environment on a particular quality. And so what they typically do is they compare people who have different levels of genetic similarity and they compare them on their concordance or agreement for the trait. So if I'm schizophrenia, how likely is my brother, my identical brother, or my cousin to have schizophrenia or have the same quality as me, right? Now, uh, this isn't a behavioral genetics class, but just to uh, tell you, you share 100 percent of your genetic material with your identical twin, you share 50 percent genetic material with your parents, you share 25 percent genetic material with your brothers and sisters, and so on and so on. And so what we do, what behavioral geneticists do, is they look for correlation of eyes Q scores among different group of, among groups of differing genetic similarity. All right, and what you'll look over here, if you'll notice that uh, identical twins uh, raised together and raised apart have a correlation of 0.8 on IQ score. There is a strong genetic component to IQ scores. And in fact, if you looked at, but if you look, there is a significant correlation in adoptive uh, parents as well. A, point, a correlation of 0.3 is not nearly as strong as a correlation of 0.7, but it still shows that there is some sort of effect of the environment. But if you look at the comparison of adoptive siblings versus identical and, uh, and uh, non-identical twins, what you're going to find is that the uh, is it genes provide a very strong input on IQ scores. So IQ, whatever it is, is genetic. Now, however, if you look right down below me, uh, I will tell you that environment does play a play a role on IQ scores. In fact, one of the biggest risk factors that I talk about in developmental psychology is having babies of low birth weight, which is one of the reasons that we don't want you to smoke because that's associated with low birth weight. That's one of the things, reasons that we don't want really uh, young teenage mothers is because they're more likely to have uh, uh, low birth weight babies. Uh, we don't want you uh, to take some drugs that are associated with 
uh, a premature birth because we don't want low birth weight babies. And in fact, it turns out that if you have a mother who is hooked on, um, on uh, morphine or one of those, uh, I forget, one of those drugs, uh, what are Oxycontins? I forget the name of that drug. Uh, they actually don't want the mother. They put the mother on um, benzo, not benzos, opioids. Thank you, opioids. And what's the what do they put you on when they're trying to wean you off opioids? That uh, that one drug you have to go to the clinic to get it. Uh, Y'all gotta help me out here. Uh, they actually put the mother on that. And they would rather have the baby born uh, with a little bit of a physical addiction to the opioids uh, than to have a because if they just make the mother quit cold turkey, she's like she's more likely to have a premature baby with low birth weight. And the doctors find it's easier to wean a baby off of this opioid addiction than it is to counter the effects of having a low birth weight baby. Some some suboxone, yeah, okay, thank you, Michael. They or methadone, that's what it is, methadone. So they'll actually put the pregnant mother on methadone. Now, when the baby's born, the baby has to be weaned off the methadone as well, and the babies may go through withdrawal effects. But doctors actually find that that has less negative consequences than having a baby uh, that's born with low birth weight. And so uh, birth weight and mean IQ score are correlated, uh, as you can see from this chart right below me. And uh, uh, it turns out breastfeeding, um, exposure to lead, paint, um, are also correlated with IQ. Uh, breastfeeding associated with higher IQ, exposure to lead paint asso associated with a lower IQ. So, um, do -do 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 -do. so here we go, uh, cultural bias. The uh, tests do show these ethnic differences. Um, and differences among races, what exactly do they mean? Are there fundamental differences in human abilities? Hmm, I'm not sure. Uh, if the IQ test measures fundamental human functioning, then I, then, then I would expect that humans are all similar. There wouldn't be any difference. So somehow or another, these tests represent culture or training or experience with the educational system and uh, different cultural orientations uh, towards the educational system. So the question is, is an IQ test really a measure of, of true intellectual functioning or is it a measure of cultural competence? Um, uh, Lisa Marie, even if you and I are going to argue uh, that it's some sort of training related effect, I would still argue that that represents some sort of cultural difference. Now, when you give, uh, when you give people, they actually have developed one of the theories is that language is the culprit. And so there are uh, non linguistic tests that test uh, abilities people's ability to reason spatially without words. Um, in fact, a very famous nonverbal IQ test is called the Raven's Progressive Matrices. And when you give people nonverbal IQ tests, the uh, difference between these ethnic groups go away. The only problem is these nonverbal tests don't predict school performance the way we need them to, so they're not quite as useful in educational settings. So IQ tests show cultural biases, and these uh, really have implications for how we talk about uh, IQ. If you remember the uh, from the eugenics webinar this week, uh, if you have groups that don't score as well on this IQ test, and we suddenly think this IQ test is the most important thing, then we run the risk of prejudicing uh, behavior against one group or another because of the differences on this particular tool. Okay. So, uh, do, 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 do. stereotype threat. Now, there are some people who believe uh, that stereotypes do play a role in how people perform uh, on IQ tests. Um, so, 
Uh, there are positive and negative stereotypes that all groups have about their abilities. There are stereotypes about Caucasian people. There are stereotypes about Asian people. There are stereotypes about African Americans and Hispanics and Southerners and Northerners. Sometimes these stereotypes work in your favor. Sometimes these stereotypes work against you. So there are positive Caucasian stereotypes that make me feel better about myself. And there are negative Caucasian stereotypes that make me feel uh, less good about myself based upon my group identity. And there is research to suggest uh, that uh, that stereotype threat, that is being put into situations where a negative stereotype is called to your awareness, impairs people's behavior. So if you put me in a situation where white people have a negative stereotype, my performance will be impaired because of the anxiety of being put into this situation where I expect bad things to happen. I don't know if that makes sense to you, all right? But uh, one of the stereotypes that was sort of uh, and some of you are not from this country, that's fine. One of the stereotypes that uh, was procreated and kind of contained in the unfortunate uh, racist past of America was that somehow or another uh, African Americans were not as smart as Caucasians. And this stereotype still persists to this day. Um, and some people sort of have these beliefs uh, about them. And the I, unfortunate problem is, even if it's a negative stereotype, you've heard it enough that it gets in your mind. And so uh, research by a fellow named Claude Steele found that when you gave people an IQ test, if you didn't call it an IQ test, these racial differences went, these ethnic differences went away. And so what he suggested is maybe the problem is that we have stereotype threat that causes different groups of people to feel like they are going to perform poorly, which then leads them to perform poorly. Right. Asians are horrible drivers. Ugh, I hate that one. <laughs> <coughs> Right, so we all have these stereotypes about uh, about who we are. And the, uh, one of the things that we will talk about in social psychology is that these stereotypes do impact our functioning. I promise they do. Now, here's the thing. Let's actually expand IQ test. Wow, that's an interesting one, Camille. I've never heard... Uh, that that stereotype before that's interesting we do we all do but you know i hate to say this stereotypes are schemas remember in chapter seven we talked about schemas when i ask you what a fire truck is you can all call up three or four things or beliefs that you know about a fire truck are you being stereotypical about a fire truck or is it a set of associations that you have in your brain now it turns out that some of the schemas that we have make important social distinctions for us so we call them stereotypes but I would say it's almost impossible for people not to have schemas or stereotypes in their head. That's kind of an unfortunate function of our cognitive uh, executive abilities. Okay, uh, real quick, I am running out of time and I am so sorry for keeping you late today, but this is only one lecture. Now, uh, the IQ test was designed to work well in school and they work very well in school. It'll predict whether or not you need special ed or whether or not you need gifted education. Absolutely. It'll tell us who's going to Harvard and who's going to have trouble um, uh, at, at uh, Iowa State or wherever. Uh, school. So IQ tests are really good in academic settings, but they don't take into account all the other beautiful ways in which human beings can demonstrate intellect. I don't know if any of you have a friend that is a great artist, but holy cow, art is a form of intelligence. I don't know if any of you have a person who is super duper creative, always thinking of new ideas. But you know what? That is a fundamental human quality that allows us to be useful too. I don't know if any of you have a friend 
that is super good at talking to people and everybody likes them. But you know what? Being likable is a form of talent too. And all of these qualities help you uh, find success just like school intellect does. And so in the 60s and 70s, psychologists said, you know what? Let's start thinking about intelligence now for the first time and thinking about what it really means to be intelligent so that we can design better tests. Okay, now the only problem is, the only problem is uh, uh, we don't have tests for these great theories of intelligence. Now, what I want you to do, I don't have time, so I'm going to ask you uh, to read a little bit about multiple intelligence and triarchic theory. All right, so Robert Sternberg argued that we should put in, not only should we have analytical or school intelligence, but we ought to put in creative intelligence, the ability to be creative, and practical intelligence, or what he would call common sense. All right, common sense. And if any of you have ever had a coworker that still hasn't figured it out three years into the job, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I mention practical intelligence. So uh, Sternberg thought we should think about analytical, creativity, creative intelligence, analytical intelligence, and common sense or practical intelligence, right? Now, uh, uh, Howard Gardner thought that we ought to think of all the modules in the brain. Remember how I've been talking to you about modularity in the brain? Well, uh, Howard Gardner says, you know what? Anything, any module in the brain that helps you to produce something that is valued by society should be considered a form of intelligence, all right? And he came up with seven different theories uh, types of intelligence he called frames of mind and he identifies them right down here uh, musical intelligence bodily kinesthetic intelligence linguistic intelligence mathematical or logical intelligence spatial intelligence intrapersonal and interpersonal now so what's neat about his theory is that he includes things like being uh, forms of intelligence that uh, include movement of the body. So your ability to paint um, or your ability to dance is a, uh, because you're controlling your body, that is something that's controlled by your, frame, your brain. That should be a form of intelligence. So he adds in the idea of physical movement as a kind of intelligence. And then he adds in emotional intelligence to the equation, intrapersonal and interpersonal. If any of you have ever had a friend that can't keep their temper, uh, you know what I'm talking about. That person is low on intrapersonal intelligence. And then if you've ever had a friend that is not very good at kissing butt, uh, you know what I'm talking about, interpersonal intelligence. And being able to control your emotions and react properly to other people is a form of intelligence. So the neat thing about Gardner is that he adds in physical intelligence and emotional intelligence. Now, finally, uh, a couple of people said, you know what, honestly, if you really look at people's life outcomes, their school ability and their creative ability isn't nearly as important as their ability to manage social relations. So there are some people who say that we should throw out IQ and instead talk about EQ or emotional intelligence. And they say that really the only thing that matters in human success is your emotional intelligence. So I want you to be able to differentiate among those three broader theories of intellectual functioning. Does anybody uh, have any questions about the lecture? I hope I didn't lose you or bore you. Did this make any sense? Did you find this interesting? I hope you liked it. If I can find a good little IQ test, I will send it around to you. Most of them want to sell you something before they give you the IQ score, which I find really annoying. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, don't forget, uh, uh, exam review is tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Uh, the Neuromatrix is available tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., and your discussion board is due tomorrow at midnight. Actually, I should do that in temporal order.
The Neuromatrix will be available at 9 a.m. The exam review session will be live at 10 p.m. And your uh, uh, discussion board will be due at uh, 12 at, at 11:59 p.m. Okay. Great. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and log off now. It's good to see you folks as always. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me a remind. But until I see you again, take care.